Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back to our uh, Pineland Speaker Series. Uh, we're very fortunate today. We're going to take a, a virtual trip to the uh, Central Pine Barrens of Long Island. And uh, we have with us today Sean Ziegler. He's a senior ecologist. And um, Polly uh, Wygrand, I probably uh, messed that up. I'm sorry. Uh, she's um, the uh, Science and Stewardship Program Manager for the Central Pine Barrens Joint Planning and Policy Committee or commission rather, and uh, they're gonna to talk to us a tale of two Pine Barrens and kind of talk to us about the Long Island Pine Barrens and how they compare to the uh, New Jersey Pine Lands. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Sean and Polly. Great, thank you, Joel. Thanks, Joel. So thank you, uh, Joel, for having us. Uh, we're happy to uh, share this presentation, um, the tale of two Pine Barrens, which we are inspired in coming to the short course. Um, for a couple of years and uh, enjoying the diversity of courses that were being offered there. And then we touched base with Joel and crafted um, this presentation to share um, some of the similarities and some of the differences related to the two uh, globally rare ecosystems that we both collectively work to preserve and protect. So Sean and I are going to present on this. We'll, I'll start the first half and then Sean will pick up uh, towards the halfway through and, and round it out and then I'll pick up at the very end, but and then we'll have questions at the end for you to call into. So our goal here is to really go over the Pine Barren ecosystem and what makes them unique and, and their formidable forces, uh, how these Pine Barrens have been protected, and then the talk about some of the ecological stewardship and management that we advance uh, to further help preserve and protect the unique diversity and uh, wildlife that are contained within them. So in a regional context, the Pine Barrens um, extend um, on coastal sands um, from New Jersey at a million acres, which is the largest all the way up through uh, Cape Cod and coastal Massachusetts. Um, Cape Cod and the coastal Massachusetts area is the second in size. And then we have the central Pine Barrens in between on Long Island and Suffolk County at a, coming in at 107,000 uh, acres. So, uh, size of an ecosystem will be a common theme that we uh, compare and contrast as far as its ecological uh, implications um, related to size. But we also have uh, inland pine barrens, the Albany pine bush um, at 30,000 acres, or sorry, 3,000 acres, and then you are over here, 3,000 acres, and then you have the Rome uh, sand plains at 15,000 acres, and then there's also some small sand um, well, Pine Barrens area over in the Schwagunks as well. And so that's the regional context of where we expect to find uh, Pine Barren ecosystems. And really what defines the Pine Barren ecosystems um, and what we use to inform management um, and what the EPA has crafted is looking at ecosystems are, you know, are the system that is developed is really related to the abiotic and the biotic interactions between um, the system. So you have the, uh, the natural, the environmental factors that influence the biotics, mm -hmm. the, the species that develop the speciesization, those that are able to persist and thrive in those conditions, and then the uh, biotic relationships that develop between the species thereafter and then survive and create the food webs and the ecosystem itself that, you know, are very much heralded. And what makes um, how we define those systems is reflective of those unique drivers, those unique uh, environmental conditions. And what we call these are ecoregions. And that's what these two different maps illustrate is defining uh, unique drivers and modifiers, whether it's geology or climate, uh, the unique topography, uh, competition between species and what persists there and unique disease and pest pressures. And then also we must include humans, you know, we are the dominant driver and modifier of many of the ecosystems um, in the world. And as a result is what we have is the, you know, these delineations of um, different eco regions based on the ecosystem that develops in it. So within the majority of the, uh, the Atlantic coastal pine barren eco region is eco region 84 in yellow here. And then that you have the Northeast ecoregion here in the coastal zone. 
uh, 59 that also, I, I don't know that it extends along here. I think that's slightly a different color, um, but there's different layers. You have a, a broad swath layer uh, defining the eco region here and eco region level three, and then eco region level four further defines it down further. And this is really an important foundational concept um, that has been most recently developed because it helps inform uh, similar management of the system and also a restoration. So when you're considering plant materials, uh, using the eco regions and selecting plant materials that are genetically adapted um, to these different climates and these different influences, whether it's the temperature uh, on Long Island and, and in New Jersey, um, you know, we're low elevation, we're at sea level, uh, there's limited topography. Uh, I think in Long Island, we reach a massive height of 300 feet above sea level. But the, the is, ecosystem is really driven by the glaciation and glacial outwash um, storm events, our coastal proximity, so the assault exposure, and then also fire influence. Uh, and so all those factors come together to define what plant materials that we would be most ideally trying to use in restorations and then also how we're managing that system based upon those drivers. So expanding a little bit further into the drivers and modifiers is that uh, during the late Pleistocene glaciation, um, both of uh, Long Island and also New Jersey were created uh, based on glacial deposits as the glacier receded and the outflow from those from that glacier created uh, fluvial deposits uh, and glacial deposits creating both Long Island. So on Long Island, we have um, uh, coastal outwash. We have glacial, glacial till and sand plain uh, with moraines that run across the top of Long Island, the north side, and then along uh, the middle of Long Island out to the forks. And then you had massive gla glacial outwash here uh, creating, uh, you know, the riverine system and then uh, effectively the peninsula here related to, um, you know, the, the larger part of the New Jersey pine lands. Um, and that's really been the foundation that has created um, the vegetation and the ecosystems to develop uh, on these, um, in both of these ecosystems. So the other uh, drivers and modifiers, uh, in, in addition to glaciation, as far as influencing the topography, um, has also been the influence of the edaphics or the soil characteristics. So commonly across both these ecosystems, um, as a result of that sand, the glacial till and the, and the, the sandy loam, or the, um, the, the glacial till and um, the sand plains is that we have very, very deep sandy coarse loams. Um, there are some clay inclusions in them, but it's well sorted glacial till. So this makes the, the environment super droughty, um, very low water holding capacity, very low organic matter. Um, so not only is it um, low in a water availability, but also a low in the ability to hold nutrients. And in turn, that really drives uh, low pH. So we have high, extremely high acidity uh, very low calcium levels to buffer that acidity. And when you have high acidity like that, it releases a lot of um, different um, minerals and, and metals and specifically uh, high levels of aluminum, which can be somewhat toxic in the environment. So the, the, the species that survive and persist here uh, have to be adapted to all those conditions uh, in order to thrive. And then related to our climate, you know, we're a temperate climate. We have very uh, high maritime influences with the winds, um, our tidal scour on a daily basis, and then the storm events. But that also brings in high levels of humidity that can influence um, uh, fire and also influence uh, the development of diseases. So um, in addition to uh, some of those uh, relationships, we also are experiencing uh, obviously high salt exposure uh, and that can, you know, shear and develop, you know, the plant materials then need to be adapted to that specific salt exposure, especially along the coastline, but then also periodically tolerant of salt exposure related to hurricanes and larger storm events that can uh, damage and influence the vegetation. Most notably, um, because of the droughty conditions uh, of Long Island and the pine, bear, pine lands, 
we uh, experience fire through uh, lightning strikes. I would say that this is not as prevalent um, as uh, human caused uh, fires, uh, but lightning is a uh, natural um, occurrence on the landscape. Again, we, we don't have it occur, develop as much in wildfires because we have rainfall that accompanies our thunder and lightning storms, but it, it does, um, these natural fires do occur and do spark wildfires, just not as frequently. And then when we consider and shift to the biotic drivers and modifiers, it's really been the evolution um, and speciesization that has driven the, the diversity of the species and the dependencies of the plants and animals on one another. And that's developed over uh, time through competition, through the ability to survive disease and, and pest outbreaks, and then the development of symbi symbiosis. And so many of the plants that we have um, in both ecosystems are, are host plants, uh, like the frosted elephant depends on the Baptisia tinctoria and the common lupine to complete its life cycle, or the buck moth on the scrub oak. So in turn, we have not only species that uh, our host species, but also we depend, uh, the plants depend on the pollinators in order to facilitate pollination and then the trophic cascades uh, that continue and support uh, the larger uh, faunal populations within the environment. So Native American um, were the, uh, one of the most uh, influential as related to early uh, Americans uh, on the landscape. The population densities are seemingly uh, unknown. We hear um, various reports from you know, low population to high population densities, very much influencing our environment. Um, and you know, they utilize the lands for migration, um, moving back and forth inland to the coastal resources to, to fish and trade, and they establish trade routes I think one of the most um, infamous has been just the use of the wampum as trade that was sourced from the clams that grew in our coastal areas. And then one of the important trade routes was uh, trading quartz that was found along our shorelines um, for arrowheads and projectile points, but also trading the flint that was uh, naturally found up in um, just south of Albany and, and Coxsackie, New York. So there was a definitely established trade routes and use by Native Americans. And as a result, they massively influenced um, and were part of the ecosystem. They use, utilized fire, they cleared areas for their hunting grounds to enrich um, the, the environment, um, reduce ticks and other uh, insects and diseases that uh, were, were pestilent, and then also utilized uh, the lands for small scale agriculture. And so these are some of the tribes um, on Long Island um, and New Jersey. They're both Algonquin tribes, um, but on Long Island, it was driven more of the of a, a dialect related that's termed Y, and in Algonquin in New Jersey was the R, the Muncie dialect. Uh, you also had the the Lanai and Lenape, um, who unfortunately were forced to immigrate and remove to Canada or out west. On Long Island, we have uh, the Shinnecock, the Okachag, and Puspatuck, and the Montaukett uh, nations. Um, the Montaukets did move off Long Island due to colonization pressures, but the Shinnecocks and the uh, Okachag both have active reservations on Long Island. So our pine barren ecosystems, um, you know, commonly are globally rare ecosystems. They're highly disturbant, dependent. They support a a high level of rarity and endemic species, um, many of which are threatened and endangered uh, because these are a globally rare ecosystem that are not found on coastal sands uh, and high occurrences. Um, and one common theme that I highlighted in the introduction is um, related to size. And the New Jersey pine lands is 11 times greater in size than the central pine barrens. And, and what that provides is when we talk about ecology is that the, the greater the size of the of the habitat and the habitat availability, the more different types of habitats that can be su supported in there. The redundancy of not only the number of habitats or so different types of habitats, but the number 
uh, redundancy of those different habitat types and the number of species that can be supported in uh, that area. And as a benefit, um, where the, the pine land thrives is that because they have this larger land area, you have a higher insurance against population loss and expert extirpation and also extinction of both habitats and the species that persist and depend on those habitats. So some of these common ecosystems that we find across the, the landscape um, are the, you know, the pitch pine and the oak forest, the, you know, these are some of the upland areas, uh, the dwarf pine plains, which we'll talk about a little bit more in extent. Uh, along the coast, you have the maritime forest, the pine oak or the post oak forest, which is one of my favorites. And then you have the transitional areas of grasslands, shrublands and heathlands. Um, you can see in the listing of these that uh, these are all listed as uh, threatened, state listed, um, threatened or globally rare ecosystems within the state or across the globe. And uh, they're all very unique and all very distinct um, and, and rare and occurring in, um, uh, in these areas. So shared dominant vegetation that we find within the Pine Barrens ecosystems is a, is a dominance on the, of the pitch pine um, and then diversified by the oaks. Uh, so there's the white oak family, which falls in uh, the species of white oak and post oak and chestnut oak. And then you have the black oak uh, family um, or grouping within uh, the oak species of the scarlet oak, black oak, and then the scrub oak, which is a multi-stem shrub. And then you also have um, the sassafras, which is the early successional species that comes in immediately after disturbance along with the eastern red cedar. Along the sh shorelines, we have the Ad Atlantic white cedar um, and our wetlands. And then um, most abundant and prominent in the red maple swamps and tupelo swamps would be both of those species as well. And moving on to more of the shrubbery diversified is the, you know, the bayberry and then the heath species of the, the huckleberries, uh, two species of huckleberry. We only have the uh, bacata listed there. Um, the high and low blueberries, the sheep laurels, um, the very low bayberry. And then in the wetland areas and in the more mesic areas is the, the clethra and the, the ilex grabla, gabla, the, um, excuse me, the, um, the ink berry. And herbaceous vegetation um, is very commonly shared as well. Um, you have the wavy hair grass in the understory and the danthonia and, and the panicums, the switch grasses and the other warm season grasses that grow both in the grassland areas and the roadsides and also um, in the understory as well as the Pennsylvania sedge that you find under uh, the, under, the forest understory growing with the uh, danthonia. And then those are all diversified by um, many of the, the, the asters and, and the orchids, the spiranthes and the plantanthras. Um, and the, the goldenrods especially are in high diversity within these ecosystems. One of my favorite is the goat shrew, the Tephrosia virginica, which is the picture up here um, in the right hand corner. And then very iconic, um, is the species I referenced before is the Baptisia tinctoria. We also do find uh, prickly pear, which is the only pear uh, cactus that occurs in, in the Northeast is the Apuntia humifusa here. We especially find growing on the coastal shorelines. The Lespedezas pr provide an important, these are our native bush clovers, our native legumes that help um, enrich the soils and then the bracken fern. And so this is very broadly the common vegetation that's shared between the two uh, different ecosystem, ecosystems. But we also have floristic diverse differences as well. Uh, we have species in the pine barrens, in the central pine barrens that is, that uh, uh, are not as abundant as those growing within the, um, the New Jersey pine lands. Some of this, these species listed here are related to the fact that um, they're not occurring due to occurrence on the uh, northern margin of um, their habitat area and others are due to the fact that we're a highly developed land limited island um, where we haven't had the natural disturbance related to fire and other processes uh, and due to limited uh, connectivity to help support the, the persistence of these species. Um, 
those and and the species not occurring are are definitely much more readily uh, attributed to uh, us being outside the northern extent of the the growing zone for these species as well. Um, others are that they've been extirpated from the island. So silvery aster is a species that's been extirpated from New York, um, and a, a peanut grass as well. Um, and then we did find when we did a species comparison of one species that occurs on Long Island and that doesn't occur in New Jersey pine lands, which is the Liatra scarius and Nova Angeli, which is found in our grasslands uh, from Long Island north up through um, Maine. And that's an endemic species uh, to the northeast. So modern modifiers and drivers are related um, to what we see on uh, shared across the Pine Barrens ecosystems has really been European colonization. That is really what's driven how we view and how we protect and what we see in the landscape related to uh, current, um, current Pine Barrens structure and composition. Uh, not surprising that you know with European colonization there was mass deforestation um, which then drove the mass expansion to its widest extent of pitch pine, being a pioneer species, liking disturbance and clearing. Uh, it needs that mineral soil and uh, direct sun exposure in order to expand. So um, through the mass clear cutting of many of the climax community and large uh, established forest, pitch pine and scrub oak came in in abundance. Uh, grazing and ag intensification occurred um, massively and then as a result of the combination of that, what we saw has it, 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 history is identified is that um, there was mass uh, expansion of wildfires due to the increase of pitch pine and scrub oak. But there is also the altered frequency of these massive fires, um, utilizing the native the, the Native Americans used fire at certain times of the year and and in concert and recognition of the native ecosystem and, and when it would be preferential to burn, where the Europeans were not so in tuned with those natural cycles. And so both through um, you know, not being knowledgeable and, and being unaware and you know, hazardous practice altered the fire frequency and, and drove the development of massive uh, wildfires. European colonization also introduced uh, abundance of invasive species and then expanded those Native American trade routes and right of ways, creating many of the roadways that we see today were historically the, the footpaths and, and transport routes of the Native Americans. So industrialization continued to expand the development and urbanization that we see today. Um, in Long Island, many of the areas that were uh, utilized for uh, agriculture on poor soils were abandoned and much of the row crop um, and vegetation and, and vegetables that were grown in Long Island transferred over to New Jersey, um, where it was continued and then out to the Great Plains uh, for row crop production. And then grazing ceased as well. Um, that was not a profitable uh, and sustained use of the land. And so grazing uh, ultimately petered off. It, you know, we have horse farms and, but we don't have the large mass scale sheep. Um, grazing uh, that occurred at you know, the turn of the century. So um, what we're experiencing now is continued uh, urbanization and development in respect to uh, land use protections, but we also are experiencing uh, climate change and Southern pine beetle is a great indicator of that. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but continuing on, you know, cultural, the most influential cultural uses between the two uh, ecosystems, um, agriculture, I would highlight that uh, in New Jersey, the blueberry trade continues to be um, foremost as well as cranberry, where that has petered off on Long Island. Um, we do have farmers that do have, um, you know, picking agro entertainment of blueberries and, uh, but not cranberries. And, but in New Jersey, you know, definitely was, um, you know, and continues to be the producer of these crops that are native to our area uh, intrinsically. And you can see some of the statistics related to the amount of um, pr 
fruit, native fruit that was produced and sent into the cities, both from New Jersey and from Long Island. You know, I just think of 100,000 quarts harvested in 1858 being sent uh, into New Jersey or into Long into New York City from Port Jefferson Station, which is uh, on the North Shore of Long Island. Um, and also the fact that Long Island was the third largest producer of cranberries um, and that we had major bogs, but they haven't been sustained. But cannot, but New Jersey has been able to continue uh, their cranberry uh, trade. Um, which has become a major component and persists as a important um, uh, culture uh, within New Jersey. Salt hay, uh, Spartina patens, um, that was grazed upon uh, by sheep and cattle and declined and transitioned into the European pasture grasses just due to the nutrients that it would provide and the pal palatability, Spartina patens wasn't as nutritious and palatable as these improved pasture grasses. And that was attributed to uh, those declines in, in grazing over time. Um, Long Island, especially, we have one remaining duck farm, but the duck farms were highly impactful to enriching um, our waters uh, and our soils and, and facilitating the encroachment of invasive species. Um, until they declined due to water regulations um, and, and farming regulations that prohibited um, direct ditch charges to the water resources. So I talked about row agriculture a little bit, um, but it was monotypic, um, growing the flax, the oats, you know, the, the, the larger um, crops for grains and apples and vegetables and moved to New Jersey uh, for larger land areas and, and frankly improved soils that were um, much more supportive of um, uh, producing agriculture. And then I say that Long Island has a high level of prime uh, agricultural soils, but the ones that were abandoned were the ones on the Carver Plymouth on those very coastal um, droughty, low nutrient soils. So in Suffolk County uh, still does remain the second agricultural producing uh, county in New York State. So we still have a propensity of agriculture um, on the East End. And New Jersey also remains the garden state, obviously, and supporting a diversity of agriculture as well surrounding uh, the Pine Barrens. One of the most influential, influential cultural uses that we're still uh, feeling the impacts of today is the use of the natural areas for hunting. There was always a heavy harvest on our wildlife uh, and game birds uh, re requiring, with the exception of deer, of reintroductions of game birds, turkey, and quail. Um, but also detrimentally to the exportation, excuse me, of the heath hen, both in Long Island first and then into New Jersey um, and its extinction from Massachusetts and the world in, in 1932 uh, due to overhunting. And then we've seen on Long Island, especially as the exportation of uh, a number of ma mammals as well as reptiles and the implication of um, the loss of these larger predators um, and omnivores has been the increase in uh, deer populations that has been detrimental to our natural ecology and plant systems. So as a result, we're also seeing implications of increases of the mesopredators, the raccoons uh, and foxes, which has resulted in declines in uh, some of our amphibian uh, and reptile species like turtles where they're predating on um, these particular species uh, and quail as well. So the formative industries that have, you know, you'll be able to see some of the uh, influences and the legacies still remaining in the infrastructure on the public lands and across the landscape. But the differences um, between Long Island and New Jersey is that New Jersey still embraces many of these cultural industries, uh, whether it's agriculture or other uh, forest production industries, um, where, uh, and you celebrate those cultural industries where Long Island has really lost the connection to many of those uh, formative industries. So cordwood and firewood um, was sourced heavily. That was the clear cutting for building materials and, and firewood um, across, um, well, the Northeast, but in New Jersey and Long Island that we're referencing for building materials. The, the cedars were revered, revered for 
boat building and cedar shake that are still utilized today. And um, you know the pitch pines harvested, the, the sap was harvested for turpentine development and pitch development related to uh, winterizing and also waterproofing, especially boats. And then using um, the byproducts of some of these uh, wood is to create the, the charcoal of creating, um, you know, of unmarketable products to create an alternative heat and fuel source. And then turfing was very interesting um, and related to creating many of the coastal plain ponds was um, utilized to um, create charcoal. I'm not fully aware of the process, but it was removing of the vegetation and, and mining in part that, uh, in part that exposed the uh, groundwater and creating some of the coastal plain ponds. I think mills have um, remained just in their cultural legacy of many of the dams that occur today um, with some mills still persisting and being used. Um, and then the damming and impoundment was used for ice harvesting um, to have uh, you know, refrigerant um, and, and uh, cooling of your water and your beverages uh, through the summer seasons. And then mining, um, those clay deposits, those clay inclusions in our soils uh, were identified and utilized and, and harvested along with the sand uh, to create building materials. Um, our sand is particularly and continues to be revered uh, for its high silica content and, and concrete building and, and urbanization and expansion. So as I highlighted before, you know, the New Jersey Pinelands is just embraces its culture um, it's very centric to your, your celebrations. It's very centric to the Pine, Pineland Short Course and is celebrated where, um, you know, Long Island definitely embraces that heritage, but it's not celebrated and, and revered in the same way. So we um, would be remiss if we didn't highlight the influence that the military has had in both of our, eco re both of our regions. Um, the American Revolutionary War was fought both on Long Island and in New Jersey. Um, many encampments um, and, and individuals were sourced from Long Island and, and New Jersey pine lands to fight in the Civil War. And then World War I was particularly um, influential and utilized uh, in both areas for communications and uh, radio towers. Um, the Marconi and Telefunken towers uh, influenced the land uses and created many of the grasslands that still persist today. And then Camp Upton in uh, Long Island here pictured here, which is now the BNL uh, US Energy Department of Energy site housed over 40,000 soldiers um, as a training camp for World War I that were then de deployed out to uh, that war. And, and that's one area where, we, you know, the, the culture heritage is, is very much celebrated. And then currently, um, the Gabreski Airport in West Hampton, where just south of where our office is, um, is an active military facility. And then what the Warren Grove Gunnery Range that you have in New Jersey, um, both of these ecos, both of these grass, both of these airports and military institutions occur on the, the dwarf pine uh, plains, which we'll talk about shortly. So one of the interesting aspects, I utilize the RCA radio towers that we have here. Um, this is the Rocky Point. And this is the Rocky Point area in Rocky Point, New York in the Central Pine Barrens. But you can see here is, this is where the radio tower was. And each of these lines is the, the cable lines that supported these, these towers. Uh, these area, this area was mowed and devoid of vegetation. And when it was donated back to the state and created into public lands and, and park lands um, was allowed to succeed back into natural areas. And so you see the pitch pine has been uh, uh, proactively um, utilized these uh, abandoned areas. And, and as a result, you can see the historical land use patterns within these aerial photographs of our ecosystems. And so across both um, the New Jersey pine lands and also uh, Long Island in the central pine barrens, we are challenged with managing these ecosystems that have been so highly um, influenced by human land use. But we also can see the legacy of those land uses in, uh, in the nature um, in these aerial photographs. 
And to il further illustrate this, uh, I referenced it before, but the dwarf pine barrens as we were, or dwarf pine lands as we reference it in Long Island and the pygmy pine uh, plains as referenced in uh, New Jersey um, are both, uh, they're two globally rare ecosystems uh, that are only found in these two locations on coastal sands in the entire world. So they're very uh, special, they're very important. They support a high number of t &E species uh, coming in at 28 uh, globally rare and state rare species. And they uniquely support uh, especially uh, a rare assemblage of moths and butterflies in the Northeast, one of the highest levels. Um, and, and so it's very much a revered ecosystem. Um, what makes this unique is that the soils underneath them are so droughty that the vegetation that they support, especially related to the pines, are stunted. Um, and so they only grow to a, a certain height depending on the, uh, the nuances related to the soil types within there. So you'll have some areas that don't support tree growth at all um, and are low growing heath species uh, up to you know, 15 to 20 foot trees. And so the structure you see um, within this ecosystem is, is these multi-stem thickets of um, short growing pitch pines uh, that have been dwarfed or coppiced. Coppice is the regrowth from the, uh, the base of the tree. And then um, it's very much dominated and diversified by scrub oaks and the other ericaceous species, the blueberries, the heaths. Um, and they're very much a fire adapted and driven ecosystem. Um, when fire does go through this system, it's a stand replacing. You can see uh, the consumption. This was recently burned um, at the time of uh, the photo being taken where it consumes all the vegetation um, all the way up through the canopy um, uh, in part due to the low structure, but also because the pitch pines in the system don't self prune. So the fires carried up into the system. The other similarity of these two ecosystems is they've been very heavily used by the military for um, training exercises. Um, and that in part is due to the fact that it wasn't viewed as a ecosystem that could be utilized for any other purposes. It, it wasn't uh, suitable for agriculture. And so what else should we do with it, but use it for military purposes and, and bomb it and blow it up. So. Um, but in part, that disturbance has really been successful in helping preserve and introduce fire regularly and the disturbance that it's needed in order for it to persist. How are we doing on time? A little behind. Okay, I'll speed it up. Um, so some of the differences is obviously relates back to size. Um, we have 1,300 acres on Long Island of this ecosystem, where in New Jersey you have 12,000 acres. So again, that goes back to um, helping uh, ensure the persistence um, and the insurance for persistence of this ecosystem over time is, is much higher in, in New Jersey. And then the species differences is you have more of an abundance of the Quercus marilandica, the blackjack oak, the broom crowberry and the pixie moth, um, moss, excuse me, in New Jersey where we have very low abundance um, or species like the broom, the broom, broom crowberry that we don't have uh, occurring on Long Island. So the risk and conservation concerns we have with this ecosystem is you know, just the outward concern that there's only two in existence. Um, it's driven by edaphics or soils, so we can't recreate this ecosystem anywhere else if we are to lose it. Um, and with the lack of fire and the fire suppression, you know, we're at risk of losing this ecosystem um, and some of the diversity, uh, especially the invertebrates that require the regular burning to open up gaps for them to reproduce and overwinter and pupate and the, the vegetation that they need and in, in which to forage upon is critically dependent on um, that fire disturbance. So across both ecosystems, we experience a high level of urbanization and cultural exploitation. Um, but we're also equally aware that, you know, these are ecologically important and culturally valued ecosystems, um, which has really dr driven a legacy of conservation and preservation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sean. Thanks, Polly. <laughs> so I wanted to start by kind of talking about the more modern politics behind protecting these really valuable resources, because that's what really paved the way for you know, the work we, we do in the parent environs right now, both in on, on Long Island as well as in New Jersey. So 
The New Jersey Pinelands Protection Act predates the, the Long Island effort by a, a couple decades. But in 1977, um, Governor Byrne appointed a Pinelands Review Committee to kind of establish appropriate boundaries for the Pinelands. And then in 1978, a National Parks and Recreation Act established New Jersey Pinelands National Reserve. And in 1979, from both those initiatives, the New Jersey Pinelands Commission was created uh, through the Pinelands Protection Act, just kind of outlining the regulations and standards that are contained in there to help kind of guide development and the resource protection there to, to preserve and protect that real unique, significant resource that Polly described so well. So all that, that contains all the aspects of it, the ecological, agricultural, archeological, historical, scenic, cultural, recreational resources. So really a, a total package of appreciating the resource and the history of the resource in, in human interaction with it through time. And similarly on Long Island, um, the, the call for this kind of development was, was a long time in the making before the legislation actually kind of took, took effect. But in 1992, uh, the New York State Court of Appeals decision, it started this legislative process that kind of was a, a response to 30 years of land use uncertainty and, and various litigation from different development projects and different land use that was going on. In 1993, the legislature passed the Long Island's Pine Barrens Protection Act also known as Article 57 of our environmental conservation law here in New York. And it's sought to protect the largest central remaining Long Island's Pine Barren region. And this is the map here and we'll look at it in another slide as well, but we have two distinct regions within our Pine Barrens delineation area. The darker green color is a, what's known as the core preservation area. And this is where development is, is really restricted outside of very special hardship circumstances or some other you know, highly valued public need. And in the light green, that's what's known as a compatible growth area. And this has less, uh, less stringent guidelines for um, you know, hardships for development. So this is a place that encourages some smart development or growth that, that falls within certain environmental parameters that, that still comes to review through, through the commission. So the principal goals, I want to review both of those as kind of a, a broad overview of it um, from the New Jersey Pinelands Protection Act, kind of the overall statement being to preserve, protect, and enhance the natural and cultural resources of the Pinelands and in a way that still encourages compatible economic and other human activities that are consistent with the overall goal of protecting the resource. So you kind of pull out uh, four of the main, the main aspects is to develop and implement a comprehensive management plan that seeks to protect the, the ground surface and drinking water involved, uh, protect and manage rare species in the rare communities, and then again, to ensure that sound development in the area that, that is aligned with all the, all the resources involved. And to kind of compare and contrast that with the principal goals of the Long Island Pine Barrens Protection Act, uh, number one again here was the protection of our ground surface and drinking water. And as we see down in this map here, um, underneath Long Island, really all the drinking water here comes from these sole source aquifers. And so those aquifers need to be recharged in this area highlighted in the teal color. And this red circle kind of delineates the the deep water recharge area for these aquifers. So that needs some, some capacity to percolate the water to allow filtration through the sandy soils that, that in turn kind of replaces the and regenerates the aquifer from the water use and drinking water supply demands that, that human civilization puts on it. So it was identified that without some protection of this natural community on top of the aquifer, uh, continued development could really threaten the actual drinking water supplies and, and lead to unsustainability of future populations and, and uses of Long Island anthropogenic uses. So that need was, was recognized and was really one of the main calls to action that, that this land needs to be protected along with all the other, uh, the other, other needs of protection here. So also included was the protection of threatened ecosystems and landscapes, very similar to, to New Jersey. Um, as Polly mentioned and reviewed how many rare species this system supports in a variety of these community types, some of them only found um, you know, in New Jersey and, and Long Island in the world, I've other than very rare um, in the state as well as the region. So whether that's 
uh, range or whether that's just the, the type of community present that these specialists have kind of evolved to, to coexist in. And some examples down here of the, the frosted elfin, which uses uh, baptisia or lupin as its uh, nectar plants. Um, Atlantic plain, Atlantic white cedar swamp, very endangered in New York, somewhat more common as you go down to the middle Atlantic, but kind of at, at an extent of its range. And the eastern tiger salamander here in New York, only place in New York that we do see the eastern tiger salamander. So just some examples of both plant communities animal species and lepidopteran species that, that really utilize this and that are sought to protect through the plan, through the act. Uh, over time, some additions have been made to the, the core and as well as the boundary. In 1993, originally the core was designated at 55,000 acres and that compatible growth area at 47,500. And a couple additions to get to 2018, the most recent update um, increase the, the core by an additional thousand plus acres and the compatible growth area um, since, since enactment has increased also by about 1200 acres. So right now we're about 107,000 acres within the jurisdictional boundary of the Pine Barrens Act. And again, this map just a little bit bigger, kind of explain that a little bit, but just a little bit easier to see visually here. And that act has uh, influence over three different town jurisdictions, towns of Southampton, Riverhead and Brookhaven, Fall, have some overlap in the Pine Barrens area. So it's a very, very collaborative approach to kind of overseeing the development and the management of these lands. As far as the structure of the commission itself in New Jersey, uh, governed by a 15 member board, seven appointed by the governor, one member for each of the seven Pinelands counties, and then one member appointed by the US Secretary of the Interior. And then a staff size of 41 members in a variety of specialty areas, environmental reviewers, planners, scientists, analysts, specialists in support and other staff. And to contrast that with the Central Pine Barrens on Long Island, we have a five member board. Um, one of the commissioners is appointed by the, the governor by, for New York State. We have a county representative and then the towns of Brookhaven, Riverhead and Southampton are represented on our board as well. As far as our staff, um, slightly smaller staff, but again, I think that that relates to the difference in sizes of the geographic area that Polly discussed of our 100,000 acres compared to the 11 times larger New Jersey scope and scale. So right now we've continued to add staff over time as programmatic um, and, and need, review needs have increased. And right now we're at a staff of 15 and continuing to add on some potential for seasonal help for some specific management purposes, but also very much similarly divided as specialty areas to the New Jersey Pinelands Commission. Just to give a little nice uh, image of how the aquifer works here on Long Island, we've got these recharge basins, which are primarily where the, the Pine Barrens overlay is, the Pine Barrens jurisdictional boundaries showing the these glacial aquifers that sit on top of these clay and other kind of restricting boundary layers where the water can kind of accumulate and ultimately provides the drinking water. So precipitation fed and then that percolation in the soil allows for the filtration of that water as well as that kind of slow release, uh, reducing some of the runoff and then protecting the inputs into those aquifer systems. Critical importance to the state. It is really the largest sole source aquifer of, of pure groundwater in New York and, and some 6 million plus people depend on that for their drinking water and other water needs. The New Jersey Pinelands Aquifer System, um, again, combined of several different confining layers and different aquifers involved. Um, five noteworthy ones listed here. From the ecological perspective, the most important is probably the Kirkwood Kohansky Aquifer. It's the shallowest and provides water to streams, rivers, and wetlands. <clears throat> so it has the most re sur surficial relationships. But again, very, very important aquifer systems on both New Jersey and, and Long Island that were an important part of the protection. Again, Polly mentioned a, a few different places about the fire adaptations of the ecosystem very similar across Long Island and in New Jersey. It's a real dynamic landscape. 
natural ecological processes like fire and some disturbance are needed, <clears throat> or we see some shifts in the system over time from accumulation of duff and nutrients and litter that can kind of lead to some changes in the system and threaten its integrity over time. Pitch pines and a lot of the other specialist species that depend on are really adapted to fire. And in the absence of fire, we see some undesirable conditions, more susceptibility to invasive species and other pest and disease pressures. So some of those animal and plant adaptations, the dominant tree being the pitch pine, several adaptations, one of them being partial serotony of their cones. So some of the cones do open in the absence of fire, but some of them have that waxy cuticle that requires fire to reach a temperature that's going to allow those cones to open. So there can be a flush of new seeds available after that disturbance event. Another adaptation is with the bark itself. It has this real thick, chunky plated bark that allows us to be a natural insulator to guard some of the older more mature trees from being top killed by fire. It allows it to persist and through a certain level of <coughs> fire intensity over time. So definitely not enough to, to prevent loss during, you know, very catastrophic or long residence times fire, but through, you know, kind of continual low intensity fires, these trees can, can survive over time. And, and more mature specimens can survive while some of the smaller smaller trees without that thick developed bark kind of get cleared out in, in the recycling and regeneration of the system. And one of the species that, one of the rare Lepidopteran species that benefits from this kind of successional dynamic is the coastal barren's buck moth. And so in the early spring, the eggs hatch and the larvae forage among the scrub oak in the edges of kind of these pine barrens communities. Through March and April, the larvae for, forage around and grow until they're ready to pupate when they fall from the trees and search for a place to burrow. And so they burrow in the forest debris just under the soil. And they send their final caterpillar skin and become a pupa with a brown shell. And so in the fall, where they get their, their buck moth name, that you often see them flying when, when hunting season comes around. So especially during the rut and fall hunting season. So that's when they transform from the caterpillar to the moth. And it's kind of co-adapted to to times when fire is a little bit less prevalent. So you can see they're kind of kind of getting down in the soil during spring when, when fire seasons are most prevalent. And then in the fall, also they're, they're trying to fly when, when natural fires were, were less common to avoid those kind of disturbance intervals and kind of co-evolve and persist in the system. And from one of our environmental educators, you know, we've got some nice uh, children illustration here of the cycle of rebirth and regeneration and how kind of these species have these co-evolutions to, to adapt with the disturbance and, and persist through time. So you kind of see some of those summertime fires or late spring fires and how the moth life cycle kind of avoids that disturbance event. And again, some species that Long Island Pine Barrens does not have or does not have any more. So the extra extirpated species that New Jersey still retains like the Northern Cricket Frog or the Timber Rattler. But we do have some others. Maybe some of these are, are some of the extirpation pressure are because of invasive species or others that are introduced or kind of taking the place or some of the niche overlap like the eastern fence lizard and the, the Italian wall lizard and, and some other things. Some of those again are likely extirpated largely due to anthropogenic changes and land use development changes and, and fragmentation which has been a real issue over time on Long Island. Got a fun fact, greatest diversity of plant animal species anywhere in the entire state of New York. So it really is quite different than anywhere else in the state in a very high concentration of these really rare and really fascinating components and different species involved in this, these systems here. And again, I mentioned it before, but yeah, tiger salamander is only found on Long Island in New York. And so most of the breeding colonies are restricted to the central pine barrens and, and a lot of them make use of these coastal plain ponds, which are vital and very critical to their habit. And luckily a lot of these coastal plain ponds were protected in some of the core preservation areas. And again, Polly mentioned through the hunting and the uh, fur trade, a lot of these species, um, fur bears and other omnivores had been 
totally extirpated and, and thought to maybe never return to Long Island. But in the past couple of decades, we've seen a resurgence of otter populations. And there's quite a bit of surveying going on currently for otter colonies and, and wintertime surveys for latrines and other things. Um, have seen some, some regeneration of some of these other populations, you know, foxes, and we're monitoring for potential coyotes making it back on the island across some of the bridges. So that's definitely, I think, encouraging signs as a result of, of some of the protection and some of these habitats being more stable, as well as some of the you know, increased regulation on, on hunting and trapping and things with you know, limited takes and, and some other takes being totally restricted anymore. Uh, the climate change effects on Long Island. Um, again, we see a whole host of, of results of that from invasive species encroachment, new invasive species that we're dealing with, invasive species that are able to compete at an even higher level and overtake some of these systems, um, increasing frequency, variability, and intensity of drought conditions, uh, changes in wildfire regimes, saltwater intrusion, um, changes in, in storm intensity and frequency, warming coastal waters and, and inland waters, uh, more ocean acidification, which impacts shellfish industry and other marine life and, and ecosystem dynamics. And also disease and vector issues. We're seeing you know, increases in, in ticks greatly in combination with increasing deer abundance, um, differences in other mosquito and other insect and disease kind of prevalence and population dynamics. And warmer temperatures overall, which is changing to leading changes in species ranges and, and migration pathways and corridors. And that all kind of ties back into potential for sea level rise and being islands and, and having large coastlines in both New Jersey and Long Island. This is really you know, kind of an issue that we'll face with these low-lying coastal regions, very vulnerable to, to even small changes in sea level rise. So as far as a quick rundown on some ecological management and stewardship, I know we're kind of pushing hard on time here. Um, the ecology is really understanding that, that disturbance event and how these, you know, different community types that, that Polly described earlier kind of interact and have these different juxtapositions and, and edge dynamics and how they all kind of relate to be one larger system, even though they have the very independent nature within the individual communities. So the management is kind of really trying to be that holistic system of, of restoring the species that are in these systems and, and being cognizant of the, the community types and the interconnectivity between those to create this kind of really healthy, holistic mosaic. So that's really the, the focus. And, and I know New Jersey Pinelands focus on that too, of this kind of whole systems approach, this landscape level approach of all these different systems and species working together that considers the cultural, economic, and social influences and needs on those systems. So again, a very disturbance dependent ecosystem, which means kind of management intensive as well. If, if you know, wildfires are suppressed, obviously for, for human health and safety concerns, but in, in the, the absence of those, then we have to kind of take it upon ourselves to manage the disturbance in these systems, namely through fire, or else we see you know, declines in health and we see increases in pests and disease and a whole number of, of negative consequences of that. So while simultaneously increasing the risk for wildfire without management as fuels build up and increase in prevalence of, of wildfires occurring and through climate change as well, we may see an increase in just the ignitability of those fuels at, at longer durations and increased fire seasons throughout the year. So preservation was a, a, a large kind of idea that led to the Pine Barrens um, management practices or lack of management practices for a long time. There's a real preservationist ethic that now we're realizing a, a conservationist ethic and one that has active management as a component is really what's needed for the health of the system long-term and sustainability. Uh, some of the shared emerging issues, um, declining and susceptible ecosystems. So we're seeing you know, some even aged overstocked stands uh, that's leading to different pests come in. Um, gypsy moth, southern pine beetle, the pine looper, some of these other uh, diseases, oak wilt, um, and some other potential pests that have different population dynamics as a result of these changing conditions. Um, more woody and invasive species encroachment, higher hazard fuels, higher deer browse through deer population increasing and overall declining specialist species. And we're seeing more, more 
more listing of, of more of these species as threatened and endangered. Um, the pine beetle was kind of our big call to uh, more active management, seeing how susceptible we were to an, a rain shift, possibly through climate change of the southern pine beetle, um, led to really whole scale impacts in a lot of our pine stands that, that led to the need for really responsive and consistent management efforts, which we have seen success in, in the past few years, but it, it definitely draws attention to the need that these systems have for active management and increasing their resiliency and resistance to pests. We see a lot of ecological impacts from Southern pine beetle. Um, we see a lot of urban impacts through hazard tree development, the loss of different tree species, loss of some of the aesthetics, some of these you know, stands that were impacted by SPV have just really taken out a large component of the forest. And we're you know, trying to put together how the best ways to restore and regenerate these systems over time. So a lot of studies are ongoing to those respects, but it, it definitely shows that that management is important in trying to avoid some of these negative shifts that we see from lack of management and try to be more resilient, resistant to, to climate change and, and other impacts. So the idea to advance this adaptive management, having you know similar management goals across both or overall to improve ecosystem health, to be resilient to those pests and disease, provide and expand the critical habitat and those species, critical teeny species in those habitats, um, reduce wildfire risk while promoting that disturbance management through mechanical treatments, thinning, um, mastication, uh, other pretreatment for prescribed fire, um, possibly chemical treatments for some invasive species, and then ongoing and routine prescribed fire, both for restoration and maintenance and then monitoring to see the impacts and the effectiveness of those and, and to continue to adapt the, the methodology over time to improve. Uh, forest health improvement challenges in general, that previous culture of preservation, um, the idea of this wilderness ethic um, that we find that the system really is, is not that functional or sustainable trying to manage itself in in kind of an island of drawing a line around it without you know some of these natural forces being allowed to work on it through fire it really does take that that human investment and input uh some of the struggles is that you know pitch pines have a really limited commercial market um it's hard to go in there and thin and that usually leads to high cost especially on long island we're super limited of, of the ability to get those materials off the island it, it comes at great cost the equipment here for for timber is limited and, and there's a resistance to to using mechanical treatment in place of prescribed fire both economically and, and kind of just from a PR standpoint. There's been a, a resistance to cutting trees that that cutting trees is somehow you know averse to proper um, appreciation of, of nature if you will but active management realizes that there are certain densities and certain stocking considerations of forest and age dynamics that are really not healthy for the system that it takes an, an active and dedicated and science-based management approach to maintain healthy systems and improve the health over time and on long island we've had some some challenges of course we have very high wildland urban interface as far as implementing a prescribed fire program that's been called for for 30 plus years, which is really gaining significant headway in the past couple of years of introducing fire here. And we see that New Jersey's had a really successful fire culture for over 100 years at this point. So we you know, learned a lot from New Jersey's experience and it, it assists Long Island in, in developing and, and stating the importance of using prescribed fire as a management tool. So a lot of lessons learned and, and shared and some staff interchanges have taken place. And we're continuing to develop that program here, but it is with, with challenges, just with the high interface and, and without that fire culture here. So I'll wrap it up with just talking about some of the um, uh, other focuses related to uh, ecosystem health that we're both, both agencies have been focused on is the, the coastal plain Atlantic white cedar swamp and the manage of it. Um, this is a uh, ecosystem that has been highly revered, especially for the uh, white cedar. I've mentioned it before, but for woodworking and shift, shifts, mass, the shake, uh, clappered, and even for roads, um, laying those down in wetlands, uh, they are very rot resistant and for fencing. 
So as a result, uh, not surprisingly, but sadly, uh, there's been uh, a massive impact on the, um, the populations, especially on Long Island, where we have very few uh, populations remaining, especially in large, uh, large size and area. So we're, we're seeing an increased fragmentation and isolation uh, of the system. Um, in New York, it, it is considered a rare species and a rare ecosystem uh, where it's more, much more highly abundant. This picture is in New Jersey of a restoration site that was being, um, a restoration project that was being advanced. So the shared stressors across both ecosystems is climate change. Um, uh, the change in the climate is eliminating the ideal habitat for these species. They are not salt tolerant. Uh, so as uh, sea level rise occurs, especially in those populations on the coastline um, and the development on the backside of it, there's very little uh, availability for them to move upland um, related to those hydrological shifts. Um, the deer also uh, browse on the seedlings, so we're not seeing active recruitment um, of new individuals um, that can re repopulate the populations. And as I mentioned, urbanization and isolation, you're limiting on gene flow, uh, repopulation, the ability of the, the species uh, in the ecosystem to move. Um, in New Jersey, um, these, uh, these swamps are actively being managed and uh, locally we are exploring uh, future restoration efforts and needs and recognizing that this is an ecosystem that needs to be further managed. And the same with the coastal plain ponds. These ponds, as Sean you know, highlighted in a couple of his slides, support the highest level of rare and endangered species of any ecosystem in New York State. They are groundwater influenced, and so they're very dynamic system in that they have periods of drought where species like the Rexia and some of these other diversity of species are able to quickly come in, establish, complete their reproductive cycle, uh, re uh, supply the seed bank and then be flooded in uh, the next season or when the groundwater level increases. Um, the challenge that we're having, um, again, is climate change with the increasing um, and altered um, hydrologic regimens. We're seeing uh, longer periods of drawdown um, as well as increased periods of flooding in various uh, frequencies. And then also with the higher amounts of urbanization, the more water that's being used. So we're seeing uh, uh, longer periods of drawdown related to the aquifer. And then with people uh, both getting in there with their ATVs and UTVs, there's uh, the disturbance that they're creating has a higher propensity to introduce invasive species. But then we're also seeing Phragmites, as you can see in this aerial encroaching. And the challenge with Phragmites being a rhizomatous plant, extremely aggressive is that it can risks, um, especially in, in those drier water drought, drawdown periods of encroaching and overtaking and uh, effectively eliminating the habitat for those uh, 53 TNE species as well, well as the common species. And then for both of us, both organizations and ecosystems, we're constantly uh, battling emerging issues. Uh, we have just uh, received uh, spotted or spotted lanternfly is in New Jersey is in New Jersey and is moving into New York and to uh, Staten Island. Um, uh, emerald ash borer, while we don't have a high abundance of that species uh, of of ashes, um, we have had what ash we do have decimated by emerald ash borer, and then you know, horticulturally related species like caper spurge and miscanthus are constantly being introduced as new species and then species that we're not aware of that come in uh, secondarily related to the trade um, and horticultural activities. So we're constantly batting, battling and wondering what's next as far as you know managing and protecting our ecosystems. So uh, with our short hour there, uh, that's what we were able to pack in, but we have a wealth of resources on our website, including management documents and educational materials. And we encourage you to both vi visit the commission's website which is listed here. And you know, obviously it's gonna be easiest just to Google Central Pine Barrens Commission to get that. Um, but the same with the New Jersey uh, Pine Lands Commission has a, you know, a great website with wealth of resources as well uh, and educational materials. And so we encourage you to visit both um, organizations and when the Pine Land Short Course is back 
uh, after COVID next year, hopefully. Um, it's, a, it's a great educational program and strongly encourage um, you to participate and attend. We've really enjoyed um, the programming that has been put forth by Joel and, and all the partners that move uh, and gather to move that program forward. So thank you again, Joel, for having us. And uh, we have a uh, opportunity for questions. So uh, if you call this number and type in the meeting ID, um, you will be able to, we'll be able to hear you and answer your question. We do ask you to please mute your computer and, and turn down the audio. That will avoid the echoing and just be cognizant that there is a 30 second delay between our streaming um, and what you'll hear on the other end. So um, I guess with that, we'll take a pause and let give people time to call in if you have any questions. Thanks so much. Wow. Okay. Wow, man, that was a fantastic deep dive into you know, really why the areas are so unique and so special and a great job. Uh, both of you guys shared a lot of really good information and uh, I really appreciate it, uh, the program. You're welcome. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Yep. Sorry, we went yep. over a little bit. Oh, anytime to do, there's no real deadline or timeline. So, you know, good information. I figure the longer, the better in a lot of ways. <laughs> uh, I did note that there was 45 people watching. So Hopefully we'll get a few questions uh, and uh, we'll go from there. But man, fantastic program. I really enjoyed it. I really liked how you broke down the different species, what's in common, what's different. And, uh, you know, really a good overall deep dive into the two ecosystems. We tried our best. It's, it's a lot of work to compare and contrast. So yep. um, we missed some things and I'm sure there's some things that people point out that are different and we're all ears. Yeah, it's just neat to see, you know, and and a lot of those same things, the same things that happen here happen there over time and uh, especially the future. You know, we're both, like I said, climate change, climate change. We're both very susceptible to, uh, you know, as things change, as things get warmer, sea level rise is going to have a huge impact. And, uh, you know, it's really important for us to really uh, think and be prepared and, you know, enact policies that are going to help. And we have a caller. Uh, Hello, you're live on the air with your question. Hi, um, when you said that uh, you pre-treat the forests uh, for prescribed burning, um, what sort of things do you pre-treat, like, like chemicals or what, what, what sort of thing do you do? That, that, that was kind of intriguing. Sure. Yeah. As far as pretreatment, I guess that more broadly refers to kind of redistribution of vegetation materials. Sometimes that's, you know, really making sure you've got good um, fire lines, as they call, or where the edge of that prescribed fire area is going to be to ensure it is not able to cross in areas that you don't want to be burning at that time, or, or that maybe for the future to kind of break it up into more manageable units at a time. Some of that may be kind of reducing some of the, the shrubby fuels that would be right on the edge of the unit that also improve safety and visibility and, and access into the unit if you need to get equipment or water inside there. And again, kind of remove some of that heat buildup on the edge of the unit for, for staff safety. Um, some of it may be going in inside the unit if you're trying to avoid fire getting up into the canopy where you might remove some lower limbs and branches or or pull some material away from, from some trees to prevent fire from, from climbing those trees and going up into the canopy. Um, some of the pretreatment it even involves things like, you know, looking for potential teeny species that you want to try to exclude from a fire that you don't want to impact with the fire. Some of it may be establishing buffers around, you know, some of these wetland or water features where you've got a rare species like we will do here for uh, tiger salamander in some things, um, and sometimes it's going in. Uh, we've got places that have, uh, you know, 10 to 14 foot tall scrub oak that we go in there and basically kind of mow with a heavy duty mower because that would just present a, a, a prescribed fire behavior that you can't really manage safely. And so it's kind of, largely it's, it's kind of manipulating those fuels a little bit to, to make the burn safer um, to maybe make the fire progress a little more slowly, 
and ultimately to, to help you meet your objectives in a safer way. So not, not really chemical treatment per se, there may be a little bit of that depending on the manager's needs for, uh, usually that would be due to invasive species. If there's a particular invasive species that is going to respond well to fire afterwards, like if, if you would encourage conditions where that invasive species can really take off after a fire, you may need to come in and, and do a very targeted treatment on an individual basis for those species. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, that's kind of the exception more than the rule. Does, does the uh, emerald ash borer, um, how does that respond to fire? Well, it's um, the, the insects themselves, if we're talking about just the insect life cycle in, in the insect species, they are usually higher up in the trees and it's not something that, unless it's a real kind of something that's beyond prescribed fire. If it was a catastrophic wildfire, you might end up, you know, extirpating or, or uh, you know, exterminating some species in a particular area. But largely that, that insect is bored significantly into the trunk in a place where the, the heat impacts from any low to moderate intensity fire aren't really going to get to a point that it's gonna cause it much, much even bother or, or nuisance to that species. After the species has gone through and you've got, you know, these skeletonized ash trees and things and, and woodpeckers get into the bark and, and can slough off and create bark piles at the bottom of, of now dead trees that can create, um, you know, a little bit change, a little bit of a change in, in fire behavior and can contribute to some additional fuels. But as far as a, a, a treatment methodology for uh, emerald ash borer, I think they would either not be impacted or they could kind of choose to, you know, leave that particular area at that time. So it would never be broad scale enough or even, I don't think, uh, effective enough to really cause much change in their uh, species dynamics. I would add that for southern pine beetle, a lot of that would be relevant related to the infestations in the tree itself, that fire is not going to impact uh, or kill the beetles in the tree, in the cambium, but the benefit of prescribed fire operations to a forest where um, would be that by uh, implementing prescribed fire, you're, you're gonna be thinning out the forest um, and thinning out the understory. And that then uh, facilitates the dispersal of the pheromones that attra attract the Southern pine beetle to each other and cause the mass attack and mass outbreak and spread of the facilitate the spread of the insect. So by utilizing prescribed fire in our pine forests, um, that, that really helps with the, reduce the outbreaks of Southern pine beetle. It doesn't kill the beetles themselves, but it has a long-term effect on disrupting their mating uh, abilities. Um, and then that in turn helps reduce uh -huh. and reduce the size and the outbreaks of Southern pine beetle. Yeah, overall you're really improving the health of the system, which in turn then makes it more resilient and resistant to, you know, being able to withstand an invasion or resist it moving in in the first place because it's overall a healthier system. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Been Thanks, very informative. Thank yeah, you. that was a great question and great answer, guys. That really, uh, you know, hit it right there. Yeah, I mean, you got to kind of prepare if you're going to have a controlled burn, you got to prepare so it's safe. And uh, that happens here in the pine lands as well as it happens up there in the um, pine barrens. Great answer. And I, I guess I would add to that too is, you know, you really have to do the vegetation treatments, um, you know, the larger scale thinning treatments, especially you always have to maintain your, your, your burn lines. Um, but once you, you know, do that first in, intro, um, fire and, and you continue to implement fire uh, more regularly in a particular ecosystem and a, a unit, then you, you use the fire to control your, your density of your vegetation and you don't have to go through as frequently and utilize those mechanical treatments as much. Right. Yeah, that, that's great. I always can tell where each year they're going to burn based on, you know, what fire lines they redo and you know, there is a, a really high level of planning and organization that's got to go in just to be prepared uh, because it all has got to be done in a safe manner because it's still an area dominated by woods, but also there's people. So 
even the controlled burns got to be really careful with, uh, you know, the conditions got to be right. The humidity has got to be low. The wind's got to be down and uh, it's a really tight window. So they really got to cram as much as they can into the short window they have, but yet they have to do it as as safe and precautious as possible. Absolutely. Great points, Joel. Yeah, we're right in the heart of our prescribed burning season right now. February was so wet and so much snow and water. They probably were a little bit set back. Uh, but, you know, right now, especially this last run, we've had dry weather for about 10 days in a row. Uh, they've been burning pretty much every day on a pretty steady basis. Yeah, just from the different, um, you know, latitudes, you, you definitely start, your fire season starts about six weeks earlier than, than our fire season. So. Interesting. We're not that far away, but it still has an influence um, on on when the fire seasons begin. Yep. Yeah, you know, again, that's one of those other climate change connections. You know, it may make those fire seasons bigger. You know, we typically look at April and May as our wildfire season, but as these conditions change, that might expand. Maybe it expands further than summer. Maybe it also expands into the fall, and that's something that we really want to pay close attention to as uh, you know, the, the varying temperatures and the new norms, so to speak, uh, arise. Absolutely, that's a huge consideration and concern, yeah, all across the country. And as we've seen, you know, all across the world with what we've seen from, from Australia and, and, out, and out west, the fire seasons are, are becoming almost, you know, year round in some places where we're not getting that, that winter break. And that's something that, that, yeah, I know New Jersey is paying close attention to as we are here of, of seeing when those conditions are safe and when they're pushing the edge of, you know, potentially being being unsafe. So that's definitely a concern and it's a moving target, it really is. Well, and it adds to as well, the not only the changing of the fire season, but, you know, when you have those, the changing season, the, the, the lack of winter that suppresses, um, you know, is really key to suppressing the spread of Southern pine beetle that then facilitates um, the populations continue to spread and and so, you know, we saw it with the infestation spreading from the south up into New Jersey and then, you know, over to Long Island, not surprisingly. Uh, and there's monitoring in the rest of the state and Cape Cod and very diligent in monitoring for southern pine beetle. But there's significant concern if we're not getting these cold winters as we have in the past that southern pine beetle and other diseases from the south and from other areas of the world are going to continue to come in and add pressure to our, our, our systems. Um, it seems like each year we have a new insect or disease that particularly impacts one particular key uh, dominant species within our system. Yeah, you know, uh, the last two years in particular, we haven't had much weather below 10 at all, let alone down below zero. I think ideally, really, to hamper the pine bill, you want about a week or so of a good weather down around or below zero, and that'll really cut them back. Probably about four or five years ago, we had a couple winters where that was the case, and so we've had a little bit of re reprieve here uh, in South Jersey. Um, you know, some portions of the Pine Barrens in particular are some of the lowest temperatures in the state. Uh, in the wintertime because of the elevation and the way that everything works out that way. So we were fortunate. But again, the last two, three years, we haven't had that uh, condition at all. Most of our temperatures have been, you know, in the 20s, in the 30s, and maybe above freezing for the most part. So uh, I unfortunately foresee maybe some more trouble with the pine beetle uh, coming forward just based on you know, the weather observations the last couple of years. Yeah, no, those are all very uh, disconcerting trends. Uh, for southern pine beetle. So yeah, we're, we're on guard as well. We had a flight uh, last week. We didn't, DEC did, um, but we look forward to, you know, what, what their findings were as far as ground truthing for this field season uh, and suppression related to southern pine beetle. So um, yeah, we see all kinds of, yeah, phenological issues with, you know, whether it's southern pine beetle and invasive pests and disease or whether it's you know native species that start to get these environmental cues to you know come out and you start getting these misalignments between potential nectar plants or food sources and and you know the phenology based on temperature of some of the the insects and things so it's there's a lot of a lot of things to keep an eye on for sure about you know hoping things re continue to 
to line up in favorable ways and, and you know, have those natural breaks and cycles that help reduce the, you know, the natural life cycles of, of pests and disease too. So there's a lot of, a lot of things to interact for sure. Yeah, that, that's a great point. We've definitely seen, we always kind of refer to it as kind of like a yo-yo when things are blooming before they should. And, you know, you're seeing birds and plants that you're not really expected to see at different times of year. And that uh, definitely seems to be the case. Yeah, it seemed like the robins arrived back in January this year, which I'm not sure if they ever left, but it yep. was pretty early this year to see robins up our way. You know, the, the other trend that we've really noticed um, is the winters definitely are warmer, but they seem to be wetter. I mean, this last February, we had storm after storm after storm. And uh, you would think, man, that means the water table is going to be way, way high. I did some water table monitoring uh, earlier this week. And already it's dropping right back down. So even though we've got that extra amount of rain, it seems when it dries, it dries out longer and it's more, more flashy in nature. Um, you get to the point where you get so much rain, then we're gonna see a lot of the flooding issues you referred to just because the aquifer is full, the ground level is totally saturated and there's no place for the water to go. Um, so definitely again, just something we really need to pay close attention to as uh, we move forward. Absolutely. All right. Well, if uh, you guys are okay with it, uh, I think that's been a long enough time for questions. And uh, if uh, we can hang for a little bit longer, or I think we could probably wrap it up now because uh, uh, we've gone for a while. We haven't got a call for a little bit. So um, if you're okay, I will uh, end the live stream and we'll still be on the Zoom. Uh, okay. What do you guys think? No, that's fine. Sure. Yeah, I think there's yep. been plenty of time for people to ask questions. Thank you for the person that called in and asked the question. And thank you, Joel, for having us. We really appreciate this opportunity and glad that we had you know, 45 attendees. It's great. Yep. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I, I encourage everybody. I appreciate you, you listening and the time and the invitation and, and you know, both New Jersey and in the Central Pine Barrens on New York, what, what amazing resources. So I always encourage folks to, to ask questions and, and get out there and, and see what the spring holds and, and appreciate you know this amazing resource that, that everyone's worked so hard to, to protect and, and understand and, and maintain and learn from over time. So thanks again and what a privilege to live around, be around and be interested in these amazing places. All right, well, uh, you know, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your program and uh, great job today. Uh, for everyone out there, if you're still listening, next week we got a program specific to the eastern fence lizard and some of his interactions with some of the chigger mites. So that's next week's topic. And uh, with that, I'm going.